everyone, and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. Now, today's episode is with Dr. Burt Robinson. Now, he's a board-certified facial plastic surgeon with 30 years experience. He's in private practice with two offices in Alfreda and Atlanta, Georgia. Now, Dr. Robinson has been nationally recognized as an expert facial plastic surgeon by peers and patients alike. He's lectured at medical conferences around the world, which is how I know him, and he's regularly invited to speak on the subject of facial plastic surgery to residents. Now, Dr. Robinson enjoys numerous awards for his commitment to excellence in patient care, education, and safety that include Castle Connolly's Top Doctors, as well as Best of Georgia, and top doctor in Atlanta Magazine for eight years in a row. It's a good accomplishment. Now, Dr. Robinson is a huge proponent of giving back to his local community, and he supports many charities, community events, and nonprofit organizations. Dr. Robinson, thank you so much for joining me on Beauty in the Biz. Thank you for having me. I, it's a pleasure, Catherine. Yeah, thanks so much. So tell me, why facial plastic surgery? Who grows up saying, I want to be a facial plastic surgeon? <laughs> That's a great question. Well, really, it goes back to um, what I did in college. I worked in an emergency room as an orderly or a tech. And my two responsibilities was a trauma room. This is before we really had level one trauma centers. So I'm dating myself. Uh, and the uh, suture rooms where all the lacerations were taken care of. And the thing I enjoyed the most was somebody who came in like Humpty Dumpty, a laceration that was like a stellate laceration, very complicated. And the ER doctor would refer it on to the plastic surgeon to come in and put them back together. And I had the pleasure of first assisting the plastic surgeon in the ER as they put everything back together. And it just amazed me every time how I'd look at it in my novice way and go, I don't know what they're going to do for this one. And yet they would pull a miracle out of the hat and the patient would go home looking almost normal again. So I think it started there and then going into medicine and starting medical school, of course, early on, you want to be everything you're studying at the moment, cardiology, you know, whatever it is, at your rotation. But it always came back to wanting to use my hands and be able to do something that could be seen by others. And so the beauty of facial plastic surgery is the combination of those two. Gotcha. Uh, now I had been, I read your bio and you started off in a huge ENT practice with 40 surgeons. Correct. What was that like? I can't imagine 40 surgeons making a decision about toilet paper, let alone running a business. So <laughs> yeah. how, how did that go? Yeah, it was, it was a good thing. It wasn't chefs. So there would have been knives flying everywhere, right? <laughs> it was, um, it really was a good experience overall because I m made a lot of real good friends who are still good friends and colleagues of mine to this day. Um, and they are some of my referral source. I was the only facial plastic surgeon in an ENT group of over, over 40 ENT surgeons. But we were at one time, even from what I was told, bigger than Mayo Clinic. We had four pediatric ENTs. We had a head and neck oncologist, et cetera. So it was nice to be a subspecialist early on, um, made a lot of good friendships. I learned a lot from them. They learned from me. But, you know, as you alluded to at the end, after six years, it was just unwieldy. And, you know, everybody wanted to be in charge and nobody wanted to be the Indian. And so, unfortunately, the, the group dissolved. Um, to this day, I still have some very good friendships with many of those people in there. And we refer back and forth as we can. Um, but most importantly, it really jettisoned me into where I am now, because now I've been in my solo practice for uh, 21 years, and it's the best thing I ever did for myself. And at that time, I was around 40 years old. I remember calling my dad, and um, I always say my dad was the original motivational speaker. He, he um, just knew what to say and when to say it. And I was kind of confused, didn't know what to do. Do I try and hang in with the group that's dissolving? go on my own? Do I move somewhere or whatever? And, and one of the options was to go out on my own in Atlanta. And it seemed daunting to me. And yet I thought that was the right move. And it, it, his common sense was, well, son, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? And after that, I was like, yep, it's time. And ever since then, I've never looked back. 
I thought I'd missed the camaraderie, but my camaraderie is really not people I see face to face, but people I talk to, see at meetings or, you know, during a year's time. And as a result, I was able to have a lot of independence. I rarely missed a child's event, um, was able to take vacations when I wanted, how long I wanted. And in the end, all the ups and all the downs I've gotten to own, and I'm very happy with my decision. That's fantastic. Um, what what the audience doesn't know is we're both from Chicago. <laughs> That's right. Um, um, but how did you end up in Georgia? Well, yeah, it's kind of a long journey. I was born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago, and we moved to Arizona when I was in high school because my dad, who was a businessman, he worked in the Loop of Chicago, was injured the day before Thanksgiving when I was in eighth grade and had a severe neck injury. And so we had to move out of the cold, damp environment to the desert for his rehabilitation. So that's how we ended up in Arizona. So I finished high school in Phoenix and did college and med school in Tucson. And then from there did my residency in the University of Minnesota. So I went from the desert back to the tundra. And um, then I did my fellowship with Devinder Mangat um, yeah. after my residency and did some research along the way at Walter Reed uh, as an NIH fellow, and then was recruited by the group that we just talked about here in Atlanta and ended up landing here. And it seemed like a great way to get started in a major city because I knew for what I wanted to do, which was elective cosmetic surgery, I really needed to be in a bigger uh, environment and Atlanta suited it perfectly. Gotcha. Um, what Now, did you stay with ENT or facial plastic surgery or reconstructive? How did how did you obviously you had to start with reconstructive probably to get the thing going, but where are you at now with that versus cosmetic surgery? Right now I'm 100 percent cosmetic with no insurance. And that's a journey that takes a long time. And there's two schools of thought, as you know, consulting. One is you jump off the deep end and you just do that from the beginning. The other end is if you've been trained in an ENT residency, you start off doing that and build your cosmetic practice along the way. I did the latter, and I'm glad I did it that way. Um, a lot of the referrals I had early on in building my career were from nurses, anesthesiologists, um, dermatologists doing Mohs reconstruction. They saw my demeanor. They saw how I handled situations they could see that it was different from other people and built a lot of trust in the medical community that really started the groundswell. Once you then had those referrals from those type of referral sources, then your patients became your ambassadors and it builds, you know, and compounded from there. So even though, you know, it's not anyone who's done a fellowship in facial plastic surgery does not want to go back to general ENT or doing reconstruction. I don't think it's a bad necessary evil. I think there's a lot of pros to it and it builds your um, the respect in the medical community and amongst patients. To this day, I will occasionally have a patient may have taken their kids tonsils out 20 years ago and they still remembered from the way I had my office decorated, which was strictly an aesthetic practice. I didn't have Mr. Larynx on the wall. It was everything spoke about facial plastic surgery they will come in and say, yeah, you took care of my kid 20 years ago and now I'm here, I want to do my eyelids or I want to do my facelift. And it's very complimentary because they saw me as being a good surgeon, not necessarily what I did, but also just being a good surgeon for how I treated their family member. In my experience, in today's world, I, I'm not sure you can live off of the referrals anymore because of the way the insurance is set up. And I just think it's so difficult to dabble in cosmetics. There are too many competitors who just eat, drink, and sleep cosmetic. So it's really tough to compete when you're not in it 24-7 like your competitors are, or they're willing to spend more for that cosmetic patient than you are because it's just so difficult. I, I hear you. Like I used to say, just jump, you know, just jump. Right. But then we've all been through a recession from in 2008. It's like, let's not jump yet, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I hear you. I don't know what the real answer is, but st staying on the fence, I don't think is the right answer for today's world, but I could be wrong about that. Well, I think if you took my route, you have to understand that if you walked into that office, you had no idea what I did other than plastic surgery. OK, everything was built around that way. And that's why it quickly transitioned. 
And I used to laugh because it used to be they come in, they wanted their septum fixed. And they're like, oh, I see you're a plastic surgeon. Could you do my nose? Now they'll come in and they'll say, I want my nose done. And I saw in your bio that you're also ENT trained. Can you fix my septum? Yeah. That's when you know you've arrived. Yeah. <laughs> that um, That's going to always be your biggest issue with the, I need my septum. And while you're there, can you just take care of that bump? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's going to, that, that comes up. I, how often does that come up? All the time. Yeah. yeah. But at this point, my, I mean, I've been mature in cosmetics for a good 15 years. So the first five years ish was, you know, a transition. And then after that, it, I haven't looked back. OK. Now, are you the only one um, that obviously you're the only one doing surgery? But I also saw you have a PA and an RN. Where are they fitting into this? And are and I noticed you're doing quite a bit. You have a full on med spa with offering tons of non-surgical treatments. Because that's another huge investment. Can we just talk about that? Because others are afraid to put that investment in. But how important is it to have a surgical slash non-surgical practice in today's world? It's imperative. As you were talking about in today's world, in today's world, you will not make it in this space without doing non-surgical treatments. And we can break that down further to med spa and injectables. If you're not doing injectables and you say, I just have a surgical practice, you're not going to thrive in my world. I, I always make the point that injectables don't replace surgery and surgery doesn't replace what injectables can do. They complement each other. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important if you want to be a good businessman, that you have people working hard under you, that you're not doing everything. And, you know, pure profit is me in the operating room, right? So if I get injectors to do the injectables, I can be in the operating room more, which is a higher um, sell and a higher profit rate for the business overall. Mm -hmm. So I, I've um, done a lot of trainings. I'm a trainer for Galderma. So I've been around the country for 17 years teaching others how to do injectables and the practices that are successful are the surgeons that are willing to let go of the injectable practice and let the injectors get those patients, not compete with them, because they're going to be making more and more money for you while you're in the OR, okay? And you build them up, you keep the pricing the same if you have good mature injectors, which I do. Both of them have been doing it for almost 15 years each. Um, you will do much better financially and you'll have less stress and you can focus more on what you're really meant to do, which is surgery. I still do some injectables, fill in some time, but I would never make it doing what I do just in injectables. So I would strongly encourage everyone to always be looking at getting some mid-levels if the state laws require it um, and have them be working hard underneath you and get good people and then pay them what they're deserving. Don't don't hold back because they will work hard for you. And then separate from that, we have we have our two injectors and we're already looking for our third, which is great because the two now are booked out a couple months and they're full time. But then we also have an esthetician and she's been with me for 24 years and she's amazing at what she does. And um, as you said, offering the lasers, the um, Cyton, the BBL, the Halo peels. Everything from as simple as doing the, um, I'm blanking on it now, um, hydrofacials, all the way up to doing um, broadband light and halo resurfacing, having that whole spectrum and everything in the middle, um, again, allows the patient to find a space in your office so they're not ready for surgery. Or they've had surgery, I always make sure then they go through the med spa and they do their assessment to tell them, here's what you do to maintain your investment long term. And those patients keep coming back. That's the secret to that. I'm telling you, I am that patient that goes up and down that ladder. I've had enough surgery at this point. I don't want any more surgery right now. What else you have, you know? And, <laughs> right. and I'll stay put. You give, give me what else do you have? And now I'm loving. Um, the lasers have come a really long way. Um, the downtime's not half as bad as it used to be on certain treatments. Um, I mean, you're getting you're getting as much revenue out of me in between the surgical. Um, because there's so many more things to do. It's amazing. If you have all the time and the money in the world, it's <laughs> shocking. It is shocking what you can do in today's world. You can go, I mean, from the tip, uh, you know, from top to bottom, um, right. you can tighten every body part. You can fill in anything you want. You can undo. It's just shocking what you can do nowadays. So I couldn't agree more. Keep, get that patient, keep them with you, but then also have a good understanding or a bridge between the two of you 
between surgical and non-surgical mm -hmm. because I have noticed a tendency for the non-surgical staff to like hoard that patient because they don't want to lose them. And that's not the right attitude. They'll come back. Let them let right. have surgery and they'll come back to you later. I, I agree. And I think on the flip side, for, as the surgeon and the head of the business, you know, every patient at their six week follow up gets automatically sent to to either the injector or, you know, if I have time, I'll inject, but usually I'll send them to the injector um, because I know they'll be able to do the return, return routine business because my schedule is too busy with surgery and they automatically are sent to go see my esthetician as well. Um, because the patient at six weeks post op is like a bird in the nest and they'll do whatever you tell them to do because they're so happy. So if you say, look, now this is what we're going to do to take you to the next step. They want to know what else they can do. They want to know what is my next step in this journey. And I always tell them, you and I are done for a while walking down this path, but someone else is going to get on with you now and continue down the road with you. And they like to know that. And so, but it's so important that the, the surgeon says that they shouldn't have to go home and then go to your website and figure out, oh, they have an esthetician. Maybe I should call and make an appointment. They get that appointment on their way out at that six week visit. Good job. Um, now it sounds, oh, do you have any tips on how to buy lasers? That's no. <laughs> you and I were just at the Global Aesthetics Conference and uh, my good friend Ross Clevins gave a great lecture on that. I, I think you have to go slow. So here's an example. We have a great laser. I love it. The Cyton Halo, all that stuff. But then we, I won't say the brand, but we bought a skin tightening machine three years ago. And it's the best looking door jam I've ever bought. <laughs> so now they have a new flavor that's come out. Here's my recommendation, because this is really what wherever meets the road. There's a new version of something out there. Again, I won't say the name. But I told the salesman, I said, I will rent the machine from you one day a month, three months in a row, and I'm going to treat my own patients with my pictures, and then we'll look at them and we'll decide. And if it does what you're telling me it does, I'll buy two of them. Yep. But if it doesn't, I'm not buying it. So we're now on our third month on a trial. I think that's the best thing to do with any of these devices is you should test drive it first not just go by their pictures because you can be misled. So how is it going? Because skin tightening, I'm still very underwhelmed by it. I, I, I'm not feeling like I'm opening my checkbook anytime soon. <laughs> I just, I, I wouldn't go there. I just wouldn't. There's too many things you no. can do to give somebody a really good result. If you're going to make them wait, another thing is waiting three months. Patients, nobody wants to wait anymore. Everything's become so instant. Um, I just, I wouldn't bank on anything that you can't see for real. Like, honestly, honest photos. I just, good. That was a really good tip. Um, yeah. Don't jump in unless you know what the heck, like you see yeah. your own proof. Yeah. And another thing I've learned over the decades is being always honest. You know, you may have a car payment due, but that doesn't mean you should take advantage of the patient because you have a machine that doesn't really do anything. It's going to come back to bite you, right? And you'll get many more referrals with a patient, we say, you know, we really don't have a great answer for what you want right now. They're going to tell five people that this guy is honest and they're going to send their friends in as opposed to them blogging and uh, about how you took their money and the thing didn't change how they looked at all. And so sometimes we have to bite the bullet and realize we bought something that doesn't work instead of trying to push it on people and then pay a heavy price in social media. For sure. Um, that changed everything, didn't it? Oh, wow. Oh, yes. Um, so let's talk about staff because it sounds like you have a pretty good handle on staff. You've had them for a long time. What's yeah. the secret? Have you also experienced that post-COVID staff resignation or where are you at with that? Yes, I think everybody has um, staff res or they call it a slow resignation. Uh, yeah. After COVID, I had two employees who were excellent, uh, both leave to get out of medicine. Oh. They just burned out and they left, not because of working here. They they just, they went, they went in and went into sales and her husband bought it. The other one, her husband had a business and she wanted to go work with him. And she was very good and loved medicine. Yeah, we've had a problem off and on with the, the post-COVID um, slow resignation that's going on. And it's really hard. In fact, I would say that's the hardest thing in running your own business is the HR. Um, human resources is the thing that I've always found the most challenging I think, again, treat people how you want to be treated. When I was in that big group, there were times I didn't think I was treated with respect. 
And I didn't want to ever do that to an employee that I had if I went out on my own. I think people need to be able to make a good wage, reasonable for what they're um, doing for the business. And I, I also provide all the extras. I provide health insurance. Um, we They have their PTO off. We have a, a medical, um, was it 125? Mm. I can't, I think that's what it is. Um, and I pay for everyone's lunch every day. We get groceries every week. Everyone puts in what they want to eat. And so they don't have to leave the office. So they make whatever they want to eat. Um, try, and, try and do everything I can, you know, retreats, do everything possible to make them know that they're appreciated. And, uh, you know, it's a fine line because you don't want to become so close like family, but close enough that they know that they are appreciated. And anytime I ever get an award, I always send my email and verbally say, we won this. I didn't win this. And I think when staff are treated with respect, overall, you won't have a big revolving door going on. That being said, um, probably the biggest mistake I've made in my career in owning a business is sometimes I hired from within and I should not have. The Peter Principle has shown up more than once in my um, office and I own that, that's my fault. But you become close to staff and you think they can do the next level job and that's not always the case. And so I'd recommend to your listeners, think twice before you hire for a higher position from hiring within. You may want to keep that for outside. There's advantages of keeping people within and promoting them, but you may be promoting them to a position they're really not capable of performing. And perhaps your personal appreciation for them can get in the way of your business decisions. And then once you do that, it's difficult to demote them back to where they were. It's getting all awkward, <laughs> um, yep. but that's too bad. That, I don't find that happens as much. I'll tell you what I have learned that it's happened lately, which um, I've completely changed my stance on this. I used to have uh, like a staff reward program um, and I would, you give them like um, $250 a quarter as long as that new patient stayed that they referred, not patient, I'm sorry, um, their friend, you know, referred and then they stayed. So they kept getting paid for it for that year. So they got a thousand dollars, you know, to have this referral. The issue is if they leave, then the other person leaves. So now you lost two people at the same time. Um, <laughs> You know, yeah. so I thought, well, okay, that's not working out as well as it used to. <laughs> so, no. Yeah, no. I, I think it's always going to be a challenge because we human beings are complex, you know, at the at best, and circumstances change and life changes. But I mean, it, it sounds like you've had a a good run though. You, if you've had people that have been with you for more than five years, I think it's genius, you know. And you're feeding them quite well. I mean, I hope they appreciate that. That's a big deal. I think they do. They show it by staying and working really hard. I think um, it's a good mutual respect and, and they do everything I ask of them with a smile. You know, we always say a servant attitude is what you have to have here. This is Disney World for adult women, basically. Right. How right? do you how do you get that culture? I am shocked when I'm the consultant who's going to do a practice assessment on site, shocked at the some of the attitudes that I, they don't look up. They don't acknowledge me as I walk in or walk by. They don't smile. And I think, really, you're this is a fun medicine business. <laughs> you know, like know. Well, you're not having fun and you're not letting me have fun. Um, I just how do you teach that? I, that's a great question, Catherine. And I think you teach it by demonstrating it. It's by your leadership of a servant attitude. There's nothing in this office that's below me that I wouldn't do. Like if my medical assistant's busy, I'll grab a chart. I'll bring the patient back. I'll room. I'll take the pictures. I think everyone needs to see the leader being willing to do that. I think that's where it starts. And I also think um, showing respect for everybody in the practice, no matter whether it's the administrator or the front desk person, they all have an important role. And really, one doesn't supersede the other one necessarily. And I learned that because my first job in college was a um, a clerk with the old IBM Selectric typewriter in the emergency room typing out admission forms and triaging patients. That was my first year in the ER. And then the following years is when I became an orderly. But I realized what it was like to answer phones, to deal with patients through a window. Um, and then it being, um, you know, an orderly, being on the nursing side, not the physician side, and seeing what made 
things easier for me and how I could be disrespected or respected. And I think learning that and then reproducing what I thought was appropriate when I would have my own business and people who are working for me that I wouldn't make those faux pas to them. Good for you. Um, so then do you still have two locations? We have our main location, as you mentioned, is in Alpharetta. The second location, we are there um, off and on. It's down, it's with a cosmetic dermatology practice, more inside Atlanta. You've heard of trading barriers, mm -hmm. you know, so Atlanta is surrounded by an interstate. And so you either live in the perimeter or outside the perimeter. So sometimes you need to have a presence inside the perimeter because people in the perimeter just don't want to go outside the perimeter to Alpharetta. Mm -hmm. But most of my time is spent in Alpharetta. Okay. Because I know a lot of the um, practices, they have a satellite office and it's mm -hmm. basically to attract just a, a bigger target audience. But then I, now I look at that and I say, I think we should do a cost benefit analysis of that. For you to be out of the office, commuting, uh, worrying about what's happening there when you're not there. But in your case, that was different. You were just, it, you didn't have to run this whole practice and staff it and all of that. Um, but I think, again, in today's world, I think the complexity of that can often outweigh the advantage of it. I agree. We were down there a lot more 50-50 and it became complex. And that was still subleasing. That wasn't a whole separate office that I was responsible for. I was it was a turnkey with a cosmetic dermatology practice. So it was really just show up, pop open your laptops. But even then it just became, and it became confusing for patients because mm -hmm. they would think they're going to that location to see me. And I was in the other office. Ah. So we've really limited it quite a bit now from going there just for the reasons you said, the complexity. And, you know, even though I was only paying for when I was there, just no reason to pay for it. I think as you become more known in your community and your reputation, people are willing to drive. It's like your hairdresser. If she went across town in San Francisco, you're probably going to go across town, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think it's the same for us. Mm -hmm. um, so do you have any plans to expand or where are you? I mean, you've, you've been at this for 30 years. By the way, you certainly don't look at your you're holding up very nicely. I might add. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, <laughs> what injectables can do for you. <laughs> right? This, this industry is amazing. Um, so what do you have any plans like to grow or or, or not? Yeah, grow? I we're we're going to be hiring a third injector here in the next year now because our two injectors are crazy busy. And that's the nice thing about the market. As long as the economy can kind of hang in there, um, the injectable world is only going to explode. It's not going to shrink and you got to be a part of it. So that's the next step. And then I'd like to get down to four days a week instead of five uh, and then bring a junior partner in. That's what I'm looking for, you know, down the road in the next, I don't know, three to five years, somewhere in there. But I really enjoy what I'm doing. I think I'm at my best right now. Uh -huh. I don't know what I'd do if I was off the whole week, but I would like to have three-day weekends. So the short-term goal is the injector and then um, go to four days a week and then bring in a, a junior and then start to transition out, you know, um, slowing down even more and doing more things that I like to do. Do you have any hobbies? I know a lot of surgeons don't have any hobbies. Like doing surgery is what they like to do. So um, what else would you do? You know? Well, that that is, you know, that is a problem for surgeons because we have to recreate ourselves because we've been so dedicated. Um, I, I like to play golf. I'm not good at it, but it's something I really enjoy. Oh. And I do want to focus that on because I think I can um, really take my my focal abilities and really hone in on that skill. But it's something of repetition. So I enjoy doing that. I enjoy skiing in the winter, go out to Colorado several times. I enjoy doing those two things um, and, and dinking around the, the house, some of the gardening, not a lot, but a little bit. Yeah. Well, I'm out here in uh, by Lake Tahoe. Have you no know skiing out at Lake Tahoe, Squaw Valley? It's beautiful out here. I know. I, that's one area I have not skied yet. And I've heard the snow is different. It's a heavier snow. It is. Than the, the, the powdery. But the weather's better. You know, it's like it's a lot of spring skiing a lot of times. Yes. And that's now that I'm such a I'm getting old. I don't I don't want to fight the elements anymore. So I only go if I have to wear, you know, sunglasses. You know, it's got to be sunny, <laughs> and no, no wind. <laughs> I'm jealous. Uh, that's a beautiful part of the country. And I love Lake Tahoe. I can go there any time of year and have a great time. Mm, lovely. I need to get up there more often. Uh, so but that was the business side. Let's talk about the marketing because you're you're in a very competitive area there. 
Um, did you, how, how do you differentiate yourself from everybody else? And do you do it any differently now than you used to? Um, that's a great question. I, I don't know if I differentiate myself on purpose. I think what differentiates me is my honesty and always giving my best and staying humble. Um, I think that those are the main things and staying true to what my roots are, which is sometimes facial plastic surgeons like to drift below the neck. Mm -hmm. And I think that dilutes you. That doesn't make you an expert anymore. I can't tell you how many times a week someone goes, I'm coming to you because you only work on the face. There's only pictures of the face. All you talk about is the face. I want an expert like that. I don't want the break guy working on my transmission. Right. And so that by itself is huge. So you've already condensed down quite a bit um, who I am because there's a lot of general plastic surgeons here and some of them are very good in the face, too. But pa I think patients are becoming very sophisticated in what they're looking for. And me staying true to that has been smart. Um, I think what also differentiates a lot is reviews, yep. you know, talking about marketing. I, I will say I was on the bandwagon really early with reviews. And if you Google and look, I, I have quite a few reviews yep. and anything I buy now, I go online and I do a review. Yep. I don't talk, to, I don't look at what the company says. I look to see what the buyer says and patients several a week come in. It's like, you have such great reviews. I just wanted to meet you in person and see if you're the right person. I think reviews differentiate you quite a bit and doing your best will be reflected in those reviews everyone's going to get a bad review now and then just like the four seasons and the Ritz Carlton. But if, as Jeff Siegel says, the solution to pollution is dilution. As long as you're getting a lot of good, positive reviews, those few negative reviews just really justify that those are all real. It's not, you know, your mom at home with an IP address cranking yeah. them out every day. And so I think again, being the, who you truly are and letting that be shown through patients and what they say about you differentiates you quite a bit. You also did a really good job with video testimonials from patients. That's mm -hmm. the next step that I think we all we all have to embrace video. Uh, the audience today is just too lazy to read or I don't know what's going on, but it's all very visual now and very entertaining. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you, and, and it looks like you've did a, done a good job with that. Was there any secret to getting the patients to do it? Probably you asking was probably yeah, a good start. That's, these are such great questions. Um, so let's go back to reviews for a second, then we'll go into that. I think the key of getting a review is I have to ask yeah. for it. And a lot of surgeons can be timid, shy, or that's below them to ask for it. But like you said, you got to do it. If you want to get a review, you have to ask for it. Mm -hmm. And you need to get it in the moment. Don't send them a link because that's going to get lost in all their other social media. So it's done in the exam room at that time. That's critical. Now, as far as getting patients to do video reviews, same thing. It's asking and it's me asking, not going, I don't want to ask them. Send the marketing director in because she, she would turn around and say, no, the way it's going to work is you have to ask them. <laughs> and asking the patient directly, I just tell them, you have such an amazing result, and I'd love to share it with other patients. You have a great demonstration of, you know, um, jowling that got resolved or um, a tip that was under rotated, and it's a beautiful rotation, blah, blah, blah. And they're already happy with the result. So that sweet spot, again, to me, is at about six to eight weeks post-op. That's when you ask them, and rarely do they say no. And I always preface it with, look, we have plenty of videos, which we do. There's no pressure, but I think you're well-spoken. You look beautiful. Could we have you do a video testimonial? 90% of the time they say yes. Who would say no to that? I mean, Aaron, you're, getting, you're good at the compliments. That, that's helpful. <laughs> yeah, I mean, complimenting them because you really do believe it. We're not going to put up something that's not a great result. We want a great result. And we want you to be the one. And um, they're very ha they're very happy to do it. And then getting a great videographer. We have an amazing videographer uh, here in Atlanta, and he shows up after five o'clock, and our marketing director and I'm there, and that's when we shoot it. And they've really got it down to greased lightning now, and they they streamline it quite a bit and do a great job. So I'm glad you got to see them. 
Oh, no, they're fantastic. Um, I used to all, also, I have this strategy where if you're not going to um, focus on the reviews all the time, then at least have a biannual or an annual photo shoot. And it's done on a Saturday. Mimosas are helpful or a little wine. And you have a videographer, a photographer, hairstylist, makeup artist, uh, wardrobe <laughs> like you and it's all community service providers so that helps with referrals and you make like a whole event out of it and it's really fun it's a fun thing to do it's a pain in the neck it's like a, a, you know planning a wedding almost it's an, a, it, an event but it everyone's relaxed it's fun and it's all about let me tell you my story the issue is the timing you, catch I need you need to catch them when they're ecstatic not right. just happy Frankly, they're not even going to remember six months from now. Like they're like, they're so used to it. They're like, no, yeah, it was great. You know, no, we need them to say changed my life, you know? So anyway, there's no one easy way to do that, but boy, putting in the effort like you are and asking yourself, that's exactly how you do it. And I, and I think it's more important for the patients to say how they feel. Yes. That's where the patients bond than to me to be on a video. I mean, I'm I'm in those videos, but I'm not really telling the story. The patients are telling their story and patients will find something that that person on that video says that, you know, hooks them. And they're like, that's how I feel. Or that's what, how I want to say it. or That's what I want to look like. Um, and so I think the focus should be the surgeon, even though we all have the egos and we think it's all about us. <laughs> it's really about the patient and they want to see how the patient turned out and what they say in their own words. It's been very powerful that way. That's great. Um, are are there other marketing strategies, tactics that are working better than ever or working now that uh, or some that don't work anymore? Like what's working for you and what's not? You know, that's a good question. One thing is, you know, back in the day, and I'm old enough uh, to remember where print was a big deal right? Print marketing and being on right side, inside cover, all that placement. I think print, it's not dead, but it's its on CPR. But we still do some very, very little print marketing just to keep a footprint in that space. And looking at it, I would say we probably break even. That's about it. So it's not something that's going to be a lead sales thing, but I still think it reinforces when someone hears my name, and then they happen to see it in a magazine, they probably aren't going to come in because of the magazine, but it's like, oh yeah, that's the guy. So I think it, it's it's kind of an indirect thing. What I think has been helpful, um, the reviews we've talked about, I think is an indirect lead. I didn't think this would be as good as it is, but click uh, pay to click. Yeah, pay per click. Um, yeah. yeah, that has been really, really good. I've been very surprised at how well that has gone. We use um, Reach Local, okay, and um, Tara Leifer is our account manager, and she is a genius. Mm -hmm. And she had to twist my arm to convince me because it was at one of the meetings. Because I was like, nobody clicks on advertising, you know, and I don't want to put my name there. Mm -hmm. Well, we did it, and um, in preparation for this, we looked, and our ROI on that is five to one. Mm -hmm. It's really high. I'm surprised how many people the Google facelift Atlanta. And if I come up first with click, you know, click advertising, they'll click on that and mm -hmm. they will follow through and they'll come in. And a lot of they're serious shoppers and they will end up having surgery. Mm -hmm. Here's the caveat for everybody. You want to make sure your competitor isn't paying on their um, click for your name. Because at one point, I found that a couple of competitors were bidding on my name. So when I Googled my name, they came up instead of me. <laughs> How do you so find you have to be out? careful in that space. How do you know? You Google your name. When you Google your name and your competitor comes up first instead of you, either whoever is doing your um, pay-per-click advertising is not doing a good job, or they're just outbidding you on your own name. Right. <laughs> You right? don't know. I, that's why I. it's so murky, like this pay-per-click. It's it's murky. You don't know what is going on behind the scenes um, unless you're really looking at these analytics carefully and, and knowing what's, to, I don't know. I, I, I think it's fantastic. If it's working for you, that is fantastic. Well, I think it's getting a good rep who knows their business very well. And the other thing is then your website has to match up well with that, your SEO. And I had... Um, 
I was paying for a company out on the West Coast to take care of my um, my website. And it was so messed up behind the scenes. And I had no idea until I brought a marketing person internal and she started researching everything. We had broken links. The SEO didn't make sense. And once she took over and straightened that all out, then the pay-per-click flows with the SEO. It has to all mesh. So it is it is a web. But if you have people that are dedicated to it um, and know what they're doing, it can be very powerful. And you know what you're doing that's really smart? You have that whole out-of-town um, page um, that gives you some cachet, you know, it's, um, mm-hmm. it, it helps your brand. Um, mm-hmm. It just looks good. Um, and the reach helps as well because Google wants you to be so local now. That's why that local is working so well for you. But you also want to be able to reach in case. I mean, do you have many out of towners or? We've had people from the Bay Area. We have people huh. around the country. Isn't it interesting? It, it's very fascinating. Um, sometimes it's because they have family here. Sometimes it's because they used to live here and they trust this environment. And sometimes it's just SEO and they end up finding me. And I think you bring up another good point is if you really want to be more known regionally or nationally, you have to accommodate your patient. So we have um, partnered up with two um, hotels near our office that are almost a stone's throw. And they give a discount for our out-of-town patients when they come in. So it's been really good for them. Nice. I also noticed you um, cater to men. You have a men's section. Um, Mm -hmm. Now, just how how big of a profit center is that for you, catering to the men? I think just like everyone else, it's not the majority. It's probably like 15%, maybe on a good month, 20, but probably about 15%. But, you know, um, they they still keep coming in. They're not going to be really facelift patients. They're usually eyelids and, you know, Dysport or Botox, that kind of a thing. I enjoy seeing them, though. And and they're um, what I would call the metrosexuals. They're going to look good, too. Right. And did they're you, not over the top a, crazy. Did you build a man cave for them in your practice? <laughs> <laughs> no, if you saw it here in my office, um, it's called the bat cave. Oh, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> oh, what, what does it look like? Uh, well, we have a little shrine for um, Batman over there. It's got my face on a <laughs> bobblehead. The back of my chair here has a Batman cape. And each each room in the um, office is named, but mine's called the Bat Cave. It doesn't oh, say right. Dr. Robinson's office. It just says Bat Cave with the wings. Just very- having fun with the staff. <laughs> Do you, you don't have a cape? Uh, I wish I I wish I could fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um how what what about social media? Are you playing it a little bit? Like are you jumping in or you're it doesn't help or hurt or my my approach again to social media, I, I think that it can it can be good or I think it can bite. Mm. And so I think what happened during COVID, I I I mean I've still chuckled at some of the things I saw people doing on social media to stay in front of people, cooking a steak playing the guitar and singing. I'm like, you're not Emerald and you're not Bon Jovi. Okay. So be who you are. Yeah. And I think um, there can be fatigue from social media when every day or every other day, there's something coming out from your office that has nothing to do with what you do. And I think people can sometimes say delete, you know, disengage, don't want to be a part of it. So my approach has been more, let's keep it educational um, um, celebratory if we win an award or if it's a holiday, you know, Veterans Day, whatever it is, and keep it more in that vein. And we don't find many people falling off our social media. But for me to just do a video to be funny, to show my latest dance move, I don't think that enhances my image. And really, patients really want to see before and after pictures. And that's really where we stick to it. I think some people get a little too goofy. And maybe that works for them, but that's not my image. That's not my style. And patients really want to know, what can you do, not what can you sing for me? That's for sure. So um, we're wrapping up. We're getting close to an hour here. Um, just, I'd like to talk about your mindset and start with how did you learn the business and marketing side of plastic surgery? Because you guys did not grow up with this, nothing about it in medical school. How did you find, how did you figure it out? Gosh, you know, that's just on the job training, you know, what works and what doesn't you learn from your mentor. You know, I trained under Devinder Mangat, who is a brilliant man and 
for the marketing. When I finished my fellowship in 91, he was cutting edge. It's really learning how to change as the times change and what works and what doesn't. Talking to your peers a lot. The ones who will really tell you the truth, not the ones that will just make up stuff to make them look bigger and better than what they are. I think you learn a lot from that. Uh, and I think also always looking at it from a consumer side. What would I be looking for if I was trying to find a good facial plastic surgeon? Again, to me, social media and seeing me, you know, make a fillet on the grill doesn't tell me a thing about who I am as a surgeon. Yeah, I'm a nice guy, but really show me your results. Um, I think that that's looking at it from the consumer side, the servant attitude. How would I want to be treated if I'm coming in with expendable cash? I'm not here because my HMO sent me here. I'm here because I decided to show up. Tell them, prove it why I should be dropping money in your pocket. Um, so it's always looking at it from their perspective. And, and then it's on the job training and trying what does work and what doesn't work. And you're, you're going to spend some money and get nothing as a result. Like as an example, having an open house, um, we used to do that every year. It became a accounting nightmare for us. And it seemed like a year later, I'd have this money sitting in the pot and yet nobody had come to use it. But I knew I had to hang on to it because when they showed up to use it, I had to buy the product. Right. So we over time realized doing specials every month, working closely with the vendors, um, they will always work with you to promote their product and do a two for one or something. And it doesn't cost you anything. They're going to, you know, resupply what you're saying you're doing a two for um, saves you a lot, a lot of money. And it still, it gives you something new and fresh to promote every month. And probably the last thing is bringing up marketing person internal. You know, there's not a lot of you walking around, unfortunately, but if you can find someone who really understands cottage industry marketing, not, um, you know, Park Avenue marketing. Mm -hmm. And it's a whole different breed, as you know. And that's why you're so busy with what you do, because there's not a lot of you around. And to find someone who's that good that you can bring inside, if you find them, do it. Because otherwise, as I mentioned, you're third partying this out you got somebody in another state and they really don't have their heart and soul into it because they're not seeing you every day. So if you can ever find someone who's truly trained in marketing and knows what they're doing and understands social media, SEO, website, um, graphics, um, collateral material, that's the kind of person you need inside. That'll take a huge weight off your shoulders and let them work with it. And you'll have peace of mind knowing it's getting done. There are too many, um, you're just too busy to hold vendors accountable. And that's the biggest battle is what are these people doing for me? And yeah. am, I, am I, why am I paying them? Or what am I getting out of this? And then they send you a 30 page report with numbers on it that you have no idea how to read. And um, <laughs> it's just such a challenge. Um, but speaking about challenges, because I hope you don't mind if we talk about this. Um, we always talk about like right now, when we do this podcast, everyone's um, showing their best side. You know, I didn't wake up looking like this, you know, and you didn't just um, become a surgeon by accident. You know, could you just tap into your childhood experience that helped groom you to who you are today and gave you all of the got all these characteristics that you have now? Can you just talk about that a bit? Because it hasn't been easy for you. Yeah. So um, my childhood experience was my my mom had multiple sclerosis at a, when I was very young. So um, early on, I was doing a lot more around the house than probably the average child. Loved doing it, mowing the lawn, shoveling the snow in Chicago, um, doing all those things because my dad was more focused on earning a living and taking care of my mom as much as he could. So developed a, um, an attitude of responsibility early on and being responsible and doing my best because that's what we had to do at home. And then when my father got injured, all of a sudden, I kind of became the man indirectly for a while there at age 15. And I used to joke around that I was the Uber of 1975 because I was driving them around with my learner's permit to their doctor's appointments. But it was a great inside, um, you know, how would I say it? Just a, a way to peer behind the curtain from a um, patient side and see how my parents were being treated and what a compassionate doctor did, what a responsible doctor would do, and how my parents would feel when they left, good or bad. Mm -hmm. And then 
um, going from there on into college and then being on the provider side, but not as a physician, uh, but again, on the nursing side or as a clerk, always seeing and staying humble and understanding your roots of really what are you doing? What is your end game of what you're trying to do? You're trying to help somebody. And I always say to people that even though we're in an elective aesthetic environment, we all went into medicine to help people. Okay. We get paid well for what we do, but we get paid well because we're helping people and we're doing the right thing. And I think during COVID, I came to the realization when we came out of COVID and we we're so busy, mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much positive positivity and positive mental health we impart on patients through what we do. No, we're not curing cancer. I would never say that. Yet we are filling a void. We're doing something for people that they can't get elsewhere. And if we always maintain that servant attitude and a humble attitude and just always doing the best at that time. And a lot of times that means turning something down because it's not going to benefit them or you can't give them what they need. You're going to always be thought of well, and you'll always be kept busy because people always think the best of you. Well, good for you. I, I you know, I, I have that Chicago Midwest uh, work ethic. Obviously you do too. We were all shoveling snow <laughs> and mowing lawns and housekeeping and watching kids. And I thought, oh, dear Lord, this is, I'm supposed to be go out having fun. What's going on here? <laughs> right. So, so I feel for you. Uh, and that was, that was tough, but you persevere and you're, you, you've really built such a beautiful practice. So congratulations. Well, thank you, Catherine. I appreciate it. And you've been a part of it too, because I've leaned on you from time to time and um, we're actually using it right now with some of our surgery coordinators, because I always think you can be better. Okay. You can always take it to another level. I mean, that's what you're taught as a surgeon. You always look back and go, what would I have done differently? What could I have done to make that a little bit better? And I think that's the truth. That's the truth for all of your staff. And so you've always been a, a beacon of light um, for me in my practice. And uh, it was so fun to have you introduce me at the last meeting, because I thought that was like a circle of life. And I really... <laughs> Got a tickle out of that. Yeah. Um, I just know that if you don't keep learning and growing, you're, you know, you're you're dying. You really are. Like you've got to stay on your game if you want to play it, you know? It, it, yeah. it changes. Anyway, um, how can people get a hold of you if they'd like to? Okay, let's see. Uh, my email address is drr, Dr. R at Robinson FPS, which stands for facial plastic surgery, RobinsonFPS.com. And the number here at the office is 667-3090. Well, your website is um, robinsonfps.com. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. That's going to wrap it up for us today. I hope you appreciated that. If you did, please subscribe to Beauty and the Biz. And if you feel so kindly to give us a good review, that'd be terrific because we need them too. Um, and then if you want to share this with your friends and colleagues and staff, please do so. And if you've got any feedback or questions for me, you can always leave them at my website at katherinemaley.com. Or you can certainly DM me on Instagram at MBA. Thanks again. And we will talk soon.